This is Britain's Royal Air Force at the end of the century. Still regarded as one of the best in the world, it faces many of the same daunting challenges that dogged the fledgling service during the early years of this century. What is its role? How will it be fulfilled and with what? As the oldest independent air service in the world, the RAF has had to survive as many attacks from within as from the bullets and rockets of a determined foe. Politics, economics, technology, or lack of it, all have at some time or another conspired to threaten the very survival of the service. The genesis of the RAF can be traced right back to the beginning of the 20th century. Man is just beginning to understand the principles of powered flight. Although Orville and Wilbur Wright have made the first powered and controlled flight in America in 1903, their secrecy means that their achievement is all but ignored. However, in an attempt to win business, Wilbur Wright comes to Europe in 1908 and electrifies the continent with his flying demonstrations near Le Mans, France. France is the home of much of the early experiments with pioneers like Henri Farman, Alberto Santos Dumont, Charles Voisin and Louis Blériot. Slowly but surely they begin flying further and further. A few yards becomes miles until flying to distant countries becomes a possibility. In Britain, the aeroplane is still regarded as a toy. But in 1909, Lord Northcliffe's Daily Mail newspaper puts up a prize of a thousand pounds for the first flight across the channel between sunrise and sunset. A thousand pounds is a lot of money, and there is no shortage of competitors. One of the favorites is Frenchman Hubert Latham. He launches his first attempt on July the 19th, 1909, from northern France. The weather is not ideal, but that does not deter a large crowd from watching his attempt. but he is only seven and a half miles out when the engine in his Antoinette cuts out at a thousand feet. The plane pancakes down into a choppy sea, but Latham is uninjured. He arrives back in Calais, determined to try again. Watching from the sidelines on crutches because of a badly burned foot is one Louis Blériot. But on July the 25th, Blériot spots a break in the bad weather and prepares to launch his attempt in a monoplane of his own design. Taking off at 4.35 in the morning, he will fly without compass or watch. His aim is to fly the shortest route to the English coast but a slight wind carries him off course. He spots three ships below him and guesses that they're heading for Dover. Following them southwards, he spies an opening in the white cliffs. A man is waving a French flag. He cuts his engine, gliding to a standstill in Northfall Meadow near Dover. His first words are, that's it. 
His flight has taken him 36 and a half minutes, but history will record it as an epic journey. In the euphoria that follows, Blerio is dubbed the friendly invader, a term whose significance is not entirely lost on the military. The military implications of Blerio's flight are obvious. He has thrown an aerial bridge over Britain's protective moat. The excitement has hardly subsided when a month later the world's first aerial competition is held at Reims in northeast France. It is a pivotal week for aviation. If the Wrights have shown men how to fly, the performances at Reims will show just how far man has progressed in mastering this new medium. It also lays to rest any lingering notion that the aeroplane is only an experimental vehicle with an uncertain future. But the British military are less enthusiastic. It is down to a handful of private individuals to change the minds of senior officers. One of the first is American Samuel Cody. Mindful of the potential rewards if he can convince senior officers of the aeroplane's military value, he builds Britain's first military aircraft, Army Aeroplane No. 1. The first Englishman to fly in Britain is Moore Brabazon, flying a voisin. However, the army is taking some convincing, declaring the aeroplane useless for the purposes of war. The cavalry worried that the noise will frighten their horses. The army is more interested in balloons for observation, but the tide of progress is unstoppable. In May 1912, the Royal Flying Corps is formed, comprising two squadrons, one and three. Because three squadron is the first to be equipped with the aeroplane from the start, it adopts the motto, the third shall be first the motto it still carries today. But as Britain sets about training its new air force with whatever aircraft it can lay its hands on, the storm clouds of war loom. Europe is mobilizing its armies at an alarming rate. War seems inevitable. Then, on June the 28th, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, is assassinated in Sarajevo. Across Europe, threats are met with counter-threats as alliances harden. Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire on one side, Britain, France and Russia on the other. The final stall comes on the 4th of August, when Germany invades Belgium, whose neutrality was supposed to have been guaranteed in a treaty signed by Britain, France and Germany. Germany's Kaiser dismisses this as a mere scrap of paper. 